All right, well, you guys have asked some very good questions lately. We've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians together, and we have just finished last week the section that is on serving the church through spiritual gifts. So much good wisdom in those chapters for us, and so many funny little phrases that make us ask questions, and you guys have been asking good ones. Uh, The difficulty looks kind of like this. Now, usually, it's my job as the preacher to get to the heart of a sermon text, to ask, what is this author saying? And then proclaim that message from this author into your lives. And so very often we're looking at one text of the Bible and we're saying, okay, here's what Paul's point was, or here's what Hezekiah's point was, as he has a few words in there too, or uh, here's what John's point was, and then we're proclaiming that into our lives. And that means sometimes the questions that you would bring to the text are not the ones that the text answers most directly. And so there are in the room right now a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, So many that have piled up that I'm going to dedicate this whole sermon to answering the questions that you guys have asked about how spiritual gifts work. And then we'll have a few Sundays where we focus on missions, while we have a missionary visit, and then we send a team into a mission trip the next week. And then, God willing, three weeks later, I hope to come back to you and begin again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So that's what we're doing this week. We're looking at your questions on spiritual gifts. And the first one is not a question that any of you asked, But I wonder if there is a newcomer here or if there is someone who is new to Christianity here who is asking, well, you say spiritual gifts, what are spiritual gifts? So let me just kind of orient you to what they are first, and then we'll get to the more pointed questions that you guys asked about them. A spiritual gift is a special ability given to you by God's Spirit to help you serve God's people. I'll say that again. It's a special ability given to you by God's Spirit to help you serve God's people. We actually see them throughout the Old Testament, and then they're talked about more explicitly in the New Testament, and there's a big change that happens in the New Testament. Even in days of old, there were men like Enoch, the seventh from Adam, who had the Spirit of God rest upon him as a prophet. And then there were people like Moses who had the Spirit of God rest upon them to give them the ability to lead Israel and to speak as a prophet. From time to time in the Old Testament, God's Spirit would rest upon a special person to equip them for a special task. So you see that in Moses, and then his Spirit rests upon the 70 elders that he appoints, and they lead Israel with the Spirit of God upon them. You see the Spirit of God rest upon judges like Jephthah and Gideon and Samson, and when he does, the Lord gives them great military might. You see the Spirit of God rest especially on David and Saul to give them leadership and military might. You see the Spirit rest upon men like Bezalel and Aholiab, men that we don't talk about very often, but they were very much gifted by the Spirit of God. They were there in Moses' day when the tabernacle was being constructed, And you may have read about the very intricate decorations that were woven and carved and beaten out of gold and and wool and things like that. Well, it took an exquisite level of craftsmanship to build those things to the Lord's standard. And so it actually says the Spirit of God rested upon those two men to give them great skill and craftsmanship to build the appointments for the temple. So even for artistic ability, we see the Spirit of God rest upon people for that, for the purpose of worship. We see Him rest upon prophets many times, especially as Israel was going into exile. And we leave the Old Testament longing for a Spirit-filled King who would come and rule forever with the Spirit of God upon Him, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. And that King comes early in the pages of the New Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, that's so much my favorite part of the story that I'm just going to pause and tell you the message of what he did there when he came, our spirit-filled king who is not just God himself, but also a spirit-filled man, 100% God and 100% man. He came for us. He lived a sinless life and then died to pay the sin debt of those who had sinned against God, which is all of us. Uh, He died to pay for the sins of his people, and he rose from the dead to guarantee his people eternal life. 
And he even makes an open call now to anyone who would come to him. Come to me, trust in me, and find in me forgiveness of sins, eternal life, good guidance for life, and so much more, full restoration to God as one of his people. I would even call you, if you have never trusted in him, if you do not trust in him, trust in him for the forgiveness of sins and restoration to God and eternal life. Well, this one came, Jesus came for us, and he died and he rose, and then he ascended up into heaven. And it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives in his wake, which we've got a lot of questions about that, but then the next part's more important for today, and he gave gifts to men, it says. So he gave lots of gifts to his people when he ascended on high. And he said to his followers right before he ascended, wait in Jerusalem, don't start sharing the gospel yet, right? Uh, Wait until the power of the Spirit comes upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Sure enough, they wait in Jerusalem and the Spirit of God is poured out upon not just some of them, all of them. And there's the big difference from the Old Testament to the New Testament in spiritual gifts. It used to be special people, special tasks. Now, every believer is part of the most special task, making disciples of Jesus in all nations. And so the Spirit is poured out upon them all, and Peter gets up and says, this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. In the latter days, I will pour my Spirit out upon all flesh. Your young men, your old men, your sons, your daughters, I'll pour my Spirit upon everybody. And then in books like Romans and 1 Corinthians and others, spiritual gifts are talked about as if every Christian has them. Paul says each has his gift. One has one and one has another. One has this gift and one has that gift. And so now here we are in the church age, the New Testament era, and not just some special people are gifted with the presence of the Spirit of God in their lives to equip them to serve God's people, but everybody, every earnest believer in this room has the Spirit of God filling them, resting upon them, equipping them to do good service for God's people. That's what a spiritual gift is, God giving you some special ability by which you can help us accomplish together the mission he has given us to make disciples of Jesus, train them, and then send them all over the world. And that means that if you're an earnest believer in Jesus Christ, and you're faithful to serve the church, that the Lord will help you and empower you supernaturally by the same spirit that he helped and empowered David and Elijah. The very same spirit, very God, a very God, rests upon all of his people to help us. And that is true whether you do something public and notable like preach or sing, or whether you do something very private like give gifts in secret, or whether you do something like serve the coffee or fix the plumbing when no one is around or rock babies in the nursery, whatever you're doing to help us accomplish our mission, the Spirit of God says, I'm there, I'm with you, I'm equipping you to do this good work in the name of my Son, in the name of the Son of the Father. That's what they are. And so when we have a power like that to steward in our ministries, we begin to say, okay, I want to know just how that works. I want to know every nook and cranny of how spiritual gifts work. What is the Lord doing for me? What are my gifts? How do they work? Do I need to fan them into flame? What do I need to do? And that's the root of so many of the questions that you guys have asked. And so now we go into particular questions you've asked about spiritual gifts. First one, how many gifts are there? Very understandable to want to know that, right? What's the lay of the land? How many gifts are they? What do they each mean? Well, the answer to this one is really simple and very easy to write down, but it's not very satisfying. You ready for it? We don't know. There are several lists of gifts in the New Testament, and they are all different. Each each list is missing gifts that are in other parts of the scriptures, other lists. And there is never among all the lists an attempt to list every single one of them at once. And in fact, since each list list is missing at least some of them, we could suppose that perhaps the Spirit is doing things that we don't even know about. Uh, Beyond that, there are ways the Spirit especially empowered people in the Old Testament 
that people still do today, but aren't listed in the gift lists in the New Testament. I'll get into some of those later. And when we begin to compare the lists and put them against each other and try to make, you know, the one Excel spreadsheet to rule them all, lists of all the gifts and definitions of all of them, we run into some very difficult questions. Like in 1 Corinthians, is the utterance of wisdom and the utterance of knowledge the same thing, or are they two different things? They're listed next to each other separately as if they were separate gifts. But sometimes Paul puts synonyms for the same thing right next to each other in his lists, and he does speak of the utterance of wisdom and the utterance of knowledge as ways of talking about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ earlier in that same letter. So are they both different ways of saying preaching the gospel, or is there some nuance between them? Well, the text doesn't give us a definitive answer to that question. I can tell you what I think. I think they're both referring to preaching of the gospel, but I can't say that definitively and authoritatively because the text doesn't answer that question. We come across other hard questions like, what is the gift of faith? We can make a pretty good grasp at that, but there's never a point where it says, here's what the gift of faith is. And so we get a lot of information about spiritual gifts, a lot of teaching about it. We get more than enough to live godly and holy lives, but the scriptures just don't tell us everything that we want to know about them. That really shouldn't surprise us. The Lord works in mysterious ways all the time. The wind blows where it wills. The Lord is doing 10,000 things right now for the good of his people. And maybe we're aware of five or six of them. He does so many things that we don't know and we are not aware of. And so we can get a lot of good teaching about what some of these gifts are and what they, how they work, how you can fan them into flame. But we don't ever get the final end all be all. Let's put it in an Excel spreadsheet. Here is what the gifts are, and here is what they all mean. It just doesn't give us to it, give them to us that tightly. To try to do that would be like building the Lego Death Star with only two thirds of the Lego pieces. You would never get it fitting together just right because all the information is not given to us. So. We know a lot about spiritual gifts, we know what a lot of them are, but we don't know all of them, and we don't know how to define all of them. So we have to stop short of building a full system. That's the first question. The next set of questions comes from people who really eagerly want to know, what are my gifts, and how can I use them to faithfully serve the church? Next three or four questions are all for that kind of person. The first question in that set could I have an unused or undeveloped gift? That question is often asked by people who aren't sure what their gifts are. They want to serve well. They don't want to bury their talent. And the answer to that question is in different ways, yes. Can I have an unused or undeveloped gift? Yes, that is possible. First, you can have an undeveloped gift. The Apostle Paul told Timothy who was a very effective young man, but was still a young man, fan into flame the gift of God, which was given to you by the laying of hands. So here's a very effective young man, obviously very gifted, trusted by Paul to lead the church in Ephesus, which was a big deal, kind of the equivalent of a megachurch pastor today. But he's a young man, and so what he's got to do is take his gifting and fan it into flame, grow it, make it. Make it roar with power. Beyond that, we're told to eagerly desire greater gifts. And, so, and we see Paul say of his own preaching, for this reason I toil and struggle with all of this power and energy that he works in me. So the Spirit of God is working in him all of that power but he's not just sitting back and letting the Lord do the work. No, he is toiling, he is struggling, he is putting work into it. And so, it's not so much could I have an undeveloped gift. If you are young, I can go ahead and tell you, you do have undeveloped gifts. And it's on you to fan those into flame. How do you do that? Well, three different ways we can do that. One, if it's the kind of thing that can be practiced, then practice it, right? Some gifts, like prophecy and tongues and things like that, they fell upon people in a moment. There wasn't really a way to practice it. 
But many gifts, like service, preaching, teaching, all sorts of things, can be skills that we practice. Work at it, get better at it, whatever it is. Second, we can pray that the Lord would multiply our gifting. He tells the Corinthians in the chapters we looked at recently several times, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Right? You should want them for the good of your church, out of love for your church. We can ask God eagerly for them. And then third, you can pray that other people would be more gifted and that their gifts would develop. Uh, Paul says that Timothy was given that gift by the laying on of hands, the separating apart from ministry and prayer that was given to him. Paul says elsewhere, I long to visit you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. We're not totally sure what that means, but there's at least some teaching there of pray that the Lord will give other people great gifts. And so what we need to do as a church is first pray for yourself that the Lord will give you great gifting so that you could serve his church. Pray for everyone else in the church. I plead with you, pray for me that the Lord would bless my preaching. Uh, even just consider for a moment the amount of prayer for the church that has been lost just in Ed and Walter and Glenn, and how much we need to make up for now without those good men praying for us constantly as they were. We need the church to pray that God would gift its ministers, that God would gift those who are serving all around. Maybe the Spirit's moving you to be one of those people that prays constantly for the church. Oh, how we need it. Oh, so we should pray for each other. We should pray for ourselves. And we should practice any gift that we know the Lord has given us. The other half of that question is, is it possible to have an unused gift? And the answer to that is also yes. And it might surprise you to hear that it, that could be for a bad reason, or it's actually possible to, for a short time, have an unused gift for a good reason. I'll give you the bad reason first. The bad reason is fear. Jesus teaches in the parable of the talents, he tells a story, he said a man was going off to receive a kingdom, a master of a house going off to receive a kingdom, and he left a lot of his money in the hands of servants. He gave 10 years wages to one servant and five years wages to another and one year's wages to another. He said, invest these, make money for me. After I receive that kingdom, I'll come back and we'll settle our accounts. And he leaves and he's gone and they go and they begin to work and try to earn one mo more money for him. And then he comes back and now he's the king. They knew when he left, this guy's going to be the king. He's going to receive a kingdom. Now he comes back even more powerful. It would be really good to, you know, please this guy when he comes back and is the king. And so the first servant comes to him and he says, you gave me 10 talents. Here, I've invested them. I've worked tirelessly with them. I've made 10 more. Now you have 20. And the master is really pleased. He says, well done, good and faithful sir. You've been faithful a little. I'm going to set you over much. Here, I'm going to set you over 10 cities. And then the second servant comes back with his five, and he says, I made five more, so now you have ten. Here you go, master. And he says again, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. I'll put you over much. Let me set you over five cities. And then the servant who was only given one came back, and he said, well, I took you to be a severe man. You, you reap where you didn't sow, harvest where you didn't plow, and so I was afraid. And so because I was afraid of you, I buried the talent in the ground to make sure I didn't lose it, and now I've dug it back up, and here you can have what's yours. But I didn't invest it, I didn't earn you anymore. And the master says to him, you, you wicked and lazy servant, right? if you thought I was a severe man, you should have at least gone and put it in the bank, or it would have been safer, and it would have earned at least a little interest for me, and I could have something, but now I've you know, you haven't produced anything for me. And he cast that servant out of the kingdom. So the idea is, if we take our master, Jesus, to be harsh, severe, demanding, and we get scared and say, you know what, I'm just not going to do anything. I want to mess this up because Jesus is not very nice when people mess things up. Well, that, that doesn't please him. That, that's how we get to gifts that aren't used in a way that displeases the Lord. So if we don't use what he gives us out of fear, especially wrong fear of him, well, that's the wrong way you can have an unused gift. And some of us indeed do just that. We've got abilities, but we're just scared and we don't serve. 
Well, that's the wrong reason to have an unused gift. There are, though, occasional times in the Scriptures where the right thing to do is not exercise your gift in a certain moment, but to wait until later. Doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. The motive for this is wisdom and love for the church. I'll give you one example. We read it last week. Paul gave instructions to the prophets in the Corinthian church during worship, and, you know, they would, the Lord would give them a word, and they would stand up, and they would give their word, and he says, you guys need to do this one at a time. And so, if the Lord has given you a word, and you stand up, and you give your prophecy, and he gives a word to somebody else, too, don't you guys talk over each other. Let the first person sit down, and let the second person give their word. You imagine being this person, the Lord's given you a word, you said a third of it, and now you have to stop and sit down, right? Why do that? Well, it's wisest, it's best for the church, out of love for the church, it's the right thing to do, it's what the apostle said to do, but there you are with a word that you only said some of. Maybe you'll get to say more of it later, maybe you won't. Sometimes it's the right thing to do to hold back a little bit. There's another example of this in the book of Job. Uh, A lot of my friends tell me that this particular character is one of their favorites in the Bible. His name's Elihu. Uh, Elihu was, was there, but you don't hear about him until the ending of the book of Job. Uh, if you don't know the story, a man named Job loses everything. He's grieving, and his three friends come to comfort him. They're silent for a week. They grieve together, and it all goes well until the friends start talking. And then once they start talking after a week of silence, they argue and argue and argue. They accuse Job. Job defends himself. They argue for 29 chapters of Job. And it's excruciating to read. It's supposed to be excruciating to read because they just won't stop arguing. And then finally, they really do beat the dead horse to death, and they all stop. Like, they're all out of words. You ever seen that happen in an argument? And then, lo and behold, there's a fourth friend who has been there the whole time, Elihu. And he says, The Spirit of God has has given me a word to say. So he's got a prophetic word. But he says, I've held my peace because you're old and I'm young. And so I I let you guys finish everything you said. But now it it continues to burn within me. And so now I'm going to say this word that the Lord has given me. He lets the word out. And guys, he just mops the floor with them. I mean, oh my goodness. He just owns them. It's so good. But... He waits for 29 chapters while it just builds up in him before he lets it out. There's our reminder that a sense that God wants me to do something is not a license for impulsiveness or entitlement. No, we still have to be wise. No, we still have to love the church. There may be seasons when you have a certain gift, but it's just not best for the church to exercise it right now. You may have a gift in preaching, teaching, leadership, something like that, but just not be quite there in terms of character qualifications. And so you just need to pray that the Lord would develop you to be qualified to do that work. And then, after waiting, begin to do the work. You may be gifted in one really wonderful area of service, but have a health issue for a while and just have to say, you know what, in God's providence, I can't do this right now, and that's okay. It's best for the church. I love my church, and so this is what I'm going to do. There are times. When it's all right to step back for a minute and say, I'm not going to use my gift for the good of the church, but I hope I get to soon. So yes, it's possible to have an unused gift for a time, for a good reason. The motive has to be wisdom and love for the church. It's also possible to have an unused gift for the wrong reason, and that wrong reason is fear. Next question is, what should I do if I don't know what my gifts are? And this might be my favorite one because I can remember being there as a young man. Uh, The short answer is to to love your church and find a way to serve it. Or another way to say it it would be just find something to do anyway. Uh, There's two reasons for that. One, we're never told in the scriptures to figure out exactly who we are and understand how the gears of your heart work and just how God made you. That could be wise and good, but we're never told we have to have perfect self-understanding of how God is working through us. 
we are told to busy ourselves with the Lord's work and to work toward the Great Commission. So it's more important that you're actively serving than it is that you fully understand how God is working for you. So might as well just find something and do it. The other reason is that most of us who know what our gifts are learned it by doing it. In fact, I'll give you my testimony about that. I think that every way that I serve the church, I didn't know I was gifted in it when I started doing it. And in fact, there were just people who loved me enough to let me do it when I was bad at it. And then when I finally got okay at it, loved me enough to tell me, hey, I think you might actually be gifted in that. That's true of music. That's true of preaching. It's true of teaching. It's true of all of the ways that I serve the church. You got to be willing to be bad at something before you get good at it. Don't think just because you're gifted that you're going to step into something and be amazing at it from the get-go. No, you got to fan gifts into flame, and sometimes the embers burn so small at first that you don't even realize they're there. So find a way to serve the church. Do it alongside people in the church who you know love you. Like, don't find something to do alone in the church because nobody's going to see you and tell you that you're good at it. And then develop the kind of relationships where people can say to you, hey, I, I think the Lord's gifted you in this. I think there's something here. That's the best and most effective way to discern what your gifts are. But let's just consider for a minute, what if that didn't work? What if maybe some of you will serve the church faithfully your whole life, And then after a whole long life of not really knowing what your spiritual gifts were, but faithfully serving the church, you'll meet the Lord and he will probably answer a lot of questions for you and you'll fall at his feet and worship. Uh, What we know he will say to those who faithfully serve him is, well done, good and faithful servant. I would not be surprised if the next thing he said was, okay, now let me show you how I was working through you that whole time. You don't have to be aware of what the Spirit of God is doing through you to serve faithfully and to earn great reward in heaven. If you figure it out, great, wonderful, fan it into flame. If not, just serve with all you've got. Ecclesiastes says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Next question, are spiritual gifts inventories useful? This is also asked by people who aren't certain what their gifts are. Uh, if you don't know what a spiritual gift inventory is, it's kind of a, it's almost like a personality test. There's probably a dozen of them out there that people have made. And they'll ask you questions like, uh, do people ever tell you that you're a really merciful person? Or do you enjoy giving to your church? Or things like that, that are basically ways of kind of, you know, getting you to say some things about yourself and how you perceive yourself and maybe what you remember from what others have told you. They'll take your answers and then kind of run it through the machine and then comes back a result that says, all right, your gifts are first this, second this, third this. It's just like a personality test, but for spiritual gifts. Uh, We might ask, okay, is that useful? Should I go do that? Would that help me figure out what my gifts are? The answer is that they aren't wrong, but they are often disappointing, and that's for three reasons. First, all of the answers you're going to give are going to be self-reporting, right? They're going to ask you how you perceive yourself. They might ask you, do other people say this about you? And if it stuck in your head when people said that about you, then you're going to say yes. But if you weren't really listening when people said that about you, you're going to say no. Uh, Every answer you give is going to go through that filter of how you perceive yourself. And who among us really knows ourselves perfectly, right? What would happen if the person to the left of you were to fill out a spiritual gifts test about you? Would they answer the same thing about you that you answer about yourself? No, probably not, right? Because none of us know ourselves perfectly and the other person doesn't know ourselves perfectly either. So you're going to be giving answers from your own flawed sense of who you are and what you're good at. So that's the first reason that they can sometimes be disappointing. Then they're going to take those answers and they're going to run them through their grid for how spiritual gifts work. 
And remember I said earlier, we have a lot of good teaching in the New Testament about gifts, but we don't get the full put all the Legos together system in the New Testament. So any fully constructed grid that you could run a set of answers through is going to have some, you know, best guesses, educated guesses about what these gifts mean, and is going to have some flaws in it. So you've got my flawed answers about myself going through a flawed understanding of the whole system of how these things work, it just makes sense that the answer coming back is not going to be perfect. It's going to be flawed, right? Now, that's not bad. It could still be useful. Maybe they pointed out some things that you didn't know. Maybe they affirmed something that you were pretty certain was true about yourself. You can get a lot out of them. But the real problem is the third reason they can be disappointing, and that is the authority that we tend to give them. If you're just using it as a starting block, you know, you look at it and you say, oh, mercy, that's a neat, I'll, I'll learn what that is, maybe I have that, and that's it, great, you'll probably gain a lot out of it. But I know a lot of people who have done one, they get the result back, number one or number two, and they say, I know that's not right, and so they don't pursue that one. And they're confident that they're right about this, but 10, 20, 30 years later, there's this guilt hanging over them. You're not pursuing that gift like the test said you should, right? Because there's just something about American culture that, you know, you've probably taken tests in school that were bubbled answers on a Scantron and you got an authoritative answer back. And we just tend to give things like that a lot more power than they're due. And Satan can use that against people. He can use that to fill you with guilt for not pursuing something that was on a test. He can use it to give you a big sense of entitlement about a gift that's not really there. So as long as you remember that they're flawed and they're going to give you flawed answers, they can be useful. If you start to treat them the way that you treat the scriptures, like we sometimes do, that's where the problems can come in. So there's our answer as to whether spiritual gifts inventories are useful. A far better way is just to serve the church alongside people you love and listen to what they say. All right, next question. This one's actually three questions in one, but I I cheated and I rolled them together into one. Next question, are music, leadership, and evangelism real spiritual gifts? Three different people asked about each one of those, and I'll give you a short answer. To leadership, the answer is yes. Leadership is listed as a spiritual gift in the scriptures. Uh, We see in the Old Testament the Spirit of God rest upon a lot of great leaders in Israel. I mentioned some earlier, Moses, the 70 elders, David, even Saul, uh, many others as well. In fact, our great King Jesus Christ, even though he's God himself, also has the Spirit of God resting upon him, gifting him to lead. I don't know if that's like double the level of leadership or what goes on there. Uh, Pretty wonderful to think about. So there are people who have the Spirit rest upon them for the sake of leadership, like Joshua and others in the Old Testament. And in the book of Romans, in Romans 12, 8, leadership is plainly listed as a spiritual gift. And so we can be confident, yes, it is. Also, 1 Corinthians 12, 20 lists administration, which may or may not be the same thing, may have some overlap with leadership, but there's probably at least some overlap there. So we can say confidently, yes, Leadership is a spiritual gift. If you lead anything for the church, whether it's a family or a ministry or the whole church as pastor elder, uh, pray that the Lord would rest upon you and give you great gifting to do that. You very much need it, and the Spirit's glad to give it. Secondly, is music a real spiritual gift? And we can lump the arts in there, too, if you're into the visual arts as well. Uh, Some would say no, because music and the arts are not listed in the New Testament as a spiritual gift. However, I believe, yes, they are real spiritual gifts because they are mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, You can remember the two servants I told you about earlier in the book of Exodus, Bezalel and Aholiab, difficult to say names, but it was very much the Spirit of God resting upon them to give them great ability and craftsmanship to make all of the things for the tabernacle and the temple. And it's just listed plain that way. It's the Spirit of God resting upon them to do that. It's spoken of just like a spiritual gift. So we have at least that instance in the Old Testament where servants of God are equipped with great artistry for the sake of God's people to worship God there in the tabernacle. 
beyond that, we have this very interesting moment where David is called before King Saul to play the harp for him. David is already very prolific as a psalmist. I wonder, I should have looked up how many psalms he wrote. Uh, maybe the most prolific songwriter in all of the scripture, in addition to being destined to be king. And when he plays the harp before King Saul, the evil spirit that was tormenting King Saul is cast away and no longer can torment. There's some kind of spiritual power in his playing. Is that a spiritual gift? It sure sounds like it. It doesn't say it as overtly as it does with Bezalel and Aholiab, but it sounds like something spiritual is going on there as well. And so we do have some precedent of the Spirit of God equipping people in the arts and in music. And then in the New Testament, we are told that when we are full of the Spirit, all of us sing. And so it really stands to reason that the Lord might equip some to do that really well, uh, to do that in a Spirit-filled way, not just to sing, but to lead in singing as well. So yes, I am convinced that music and the arts are spiritual gifts, for those reasons, if those don't convince you, just fine. You know, just look at the scriptures and see for yourself. Uh, but I'm convinced that they are for those reasons. Last gift, evangelism. Is evangelism a spiritual gift? And the answer there is yes and no at the same time. Uh, the scripture does not speak of evangelism as a gift directly. Uh, that is the way that we tend to think of it, the ability to proclaim the gospel in your personal life to people, and a lot of people come to Christ. Anybody know a really good personal evangelist? You're like, man, that guy must be gifted. We think of that as the gift of evangelist, evangelism often. Well, the scripture never speaks of evangelism as a gift. It never speaks of it quite like that. But it does speak of evangelists, people. And those people are gifts. We see that in Ephesians 4. God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the preacher teachers. He gave them as gifts to the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So there are people who are evangelists, and they are gifts to the church. Now, it stands to reason those people have the gift of evangelism, but it's not quite spoken of like that in the New Testament. So we might ask, okay, what is that? What do we know about it? Well, there are two men in the scriptures that are we're told have that gift. Uh, one is Philip in the book of Acts. Uh, Philip's daughters are all prophets, by the way, which is also rather interesting. And the other one is Timothy. In either first or second Timothy, Paul writes to him and he says, do the work of an evangelist. He's talking about his gifts. He says, do the work of an evangelist. And so Philip and Timothy are the two evangelists we know about. We know that both of them traveled a lot to give help and encouragement to the churches and to preach the gospel. And we know that Philip was one of the seven deacons in Acts 6. And that's, that's really all that we know. And so that's one of those gifts that we have to make our best guess on what that is. That sounds to me like an evangelist is a person especially set apart by the Spirit of God to travel a lot for the sake of the gospel, uh, to preach the gospel, and to help and encourage the churches. But I wish we just got a nice dictionary definition there in the New Testament, and we just don't. So there's the answer on evangelism. Evangelists are gifts, and we can suppose they probably have the gift of evangelism, but that gift is not listed in that way in the New Testament. Last question. I saved the most controversial one for last. That way you'd have an easier time paying attention at the end. You're welcome. Last question, are the gifts of tongues and prophecy still active today? Most people ask this question because we read in the New Testament and even in the Old, a lot of prophets are doing stuff in the book of Acts. And even in the Gospels and even in the Old Testament, there's a lot of prophetic activity at certain times in Israel's history. And then we see the gift of tongues in the book of Acts, and it seems very active. And then we look around at the church, and it's like, well, it doesn't really look like that today. And so what's going on? That tension between what we're seeing and what we're reading in the book of Acts tends to be why we ask questions like this. There are a few answers that people give. Uh, one is, well, it's because you don't have enough faith. If you had more faith, 
you would see more prophecy and you would see more tongues. Maybe the most controversial thing I have to say is that that is a manipulative answer, and please do not let anyone manipulate you by telling you that. Why would I call it manipulative? Why would I say a word like that about an answer like that? Well, because if you haven't seen a whole lot of those things and it's not happening in your church, and then someone claims to have those gifts and says, well, the reason you're not seeing them is because you don't have enough faith. Now they're kind of holding that over the head, aren't they, right? If you had faith like I did, maybe you would, if you, if you did it like I did it, maybe you would see the things that I see. And now that gives that person a tremendous spiritual power in someone's life. Now, I'm not saying anyone who's ever answered that is being manipulative, but I am saying, please don't say that to someone. If you think you have the gift of prophecy or the gift of tongues, please don't tell other people it's because they lack faith. No, the scripture says, faith is demonstrated by love for the church, by good works, by confession of sin, by obedience to God and walking with him. That's how we demonstrate faith. It's not by having or seeing certain gifts in the church. So let's throw that one out entirely. Okay, another answer that we hear is that, well, now we have the scriptures, right? And the canon is complete, right? There will not be a 67th book in the Bible. There are 66, and it will remain 66 forever. Now that the Bible is complete, we don't really need prophecy, and we don't really need tongues. And so those gifts have ceased completely. And I agree with them all the way up to that very last thing, right? We have the scriptures. They will not be added to. There are 66 books. There will not be a 67th. But you might remember from two weeks ago, no, a few weeks ago, from 1 Corinthians 13, we are told when the gifts of tongues and prophecy will cease entirely. It says, as for prophecy, it will cease. As for tongues, it will cease. As for knowledge, it will cease. And then it tells us when. Now we see in a mirror as dimly, but then we will see face to face. Those gifts are going to cease. And what the scripture tells us is they will cease fully and finally and completely when the trumpet sounds and you and I see the face of Jesus Christ. Then, no more prophecy. Who needs a prophet when you got Jesus? No more tongues. Who needs tongues when the curse of Babel is reversed? No more knowledge. Who needs knowledge when it's flowing from Mount Zion all the time? That's when those gifts cease fully. So that argument is called cessationism, and there are a lot of important points that cessationists make that I agree with fully, but that full conclusion, I think 1 Corinthians 13 tells us we can't conclude that. No, we, they will cease when we see Jesus face to face. So how then do you explain the fact that I don't think I've ever come across a genuine prophet in my lifetime, that I've never experienced the gift of tongues, and most of you haven't either, though a few of you have told me you had, uh, that I don't expect that I'll come across a prophet in my lifetime. How do we explain that then? Well, it's actually not that unexpected when we look at the full story of the Bible. You see, God's use of gifts like prophecy tends to ebb and flow. It goes up and down, and there tends to be a lot of prophetic activity when the Lord is about to usher in a new era of salvation history. And then between those transitions, there tends to be little to none of any of that. I think early on we had Enoch and not many other prophets. And then God's people spent 400 years in Egypt crying out to God, and they they didn't get an answer. And then God rose up Moses, a prophet for them. And then he did the Exodus, right? So great prophet, now a new era of salvation history. And then the judges period goes on, and there's a little bit, but things just kind of wane. And by the end of the judges period, the book of 1 Samuel explicitly says, The word of the Lord was rare in those days. So by the end of it, hardly ever hearing any gift from God. Uh, To the point that Samuel hears God's voice and he thinks it's Eli, because he doesn't even have a grid for God talking to him, right? So very little. But then the Lord raises up Samuel, mighty prophet, to usher in the king's era, right? To crown Saul and David kings. And now the judge's era is over, and now the king's era is here. As they become less and less faithful as kings, there are more and more prophets 
until the Lord ushers in the exile, yet a new era of salvation history. And so we got a lot of prophetic activity right on the edge of the exile. And then after the exile, there's what we call often the 400 years of silence, 400 years where nobody heard from God. There were no prophets for a long time. And then suddenly in the temple, there's uh, Anna, the prophetess, there's Elizabeth, there is uh, there, there, there's Mary who gets a vision from an angel. There's Zechariah who sees an angel and all these wonderful things start happening. And what could be going on but the appearing of Jesus Christ, the grand era of salvation history. A lot of prophecy to precede that. And so it makes sense that as Jesus gives the great commission, as the gospel begins to go out, there would be a lot of prophecy to get us into that era, that the gift of tongues would be used like that every time the gospel seems to leap across those geographic boundaries from Jerusalem to then Judea and then Samaria and to the earth. That's when you see tongues in Acts, every time it makes one of those leaps. And it makes perfect sense that what we have read in church history, that about the end of the first century, those gifts started to taper off. And then by about 150 AD, there was almost none of any of them. There have been a few heretical movements that have risen up and claimed to have a lot of those gifts, like the Montanists in the past and the Oneness Pentecostals today. Uh, but really, we just don't see a whole lot of it. Why is that? Well, because we're right here in this church era. Things are going along. We're well equipped, and the Lord tends to use those gifts mightily when he is bringing in a new era of salvation history. So that's why I agree with cessationists almost completely. That's the world we're living in. You hardly ever see any of those things. And blessed be the Lord's name. He can do whatever he wants to. Uh, but we need to leave ourselves a little open to say, well, there is a new era coming, isn't there? The Lord is going to return. And on one hand, he says, I'll come in an hour when you don't expect, right? I'll be like a thief in the night. So maybe this time there will not be a rise in prophecy to precede his coming. Or often he does work that way and he says there will be signs and Revelation does speak of two men as prophets, which may be two literal men or some people think are just symbolic of the church's prophetic witness. Uh, it could be that something like that would happen as the end is so near that he raises up some prophets to call the church back to faithfulness and say, worship only Jesus Christ. So I'm going to say all that. And we're going to leave that possibility open, at least I do, in my heart. Then what I need to give you are the two tests the Scripture gives for an earnest prophet. Deuteronomy 13 and 18 actually tell Israel, if someone claims to be a prophet, give them these two tests. And if they don't pass, take them out and stone them, like execute them if they don't pass the two tests. First one is a mighty prophetic sign. If he gives you a sign and it comes to pass, okay, good, he passes that test. All the prophets in the scriptures, you can read about them, they often have wonderful signs. Moses walks in and throws his staff on the ground and it becomes a snake. You know, just incredible, miraculous things these prophets do. Those verify that they're really a prophet. Somebody just waltzes in here and says, I'm a prophet, everybody listen to me? No, we're not going to have that. No, you've got to have some kind of sign from the Lord. So that's one. And then in the other of those two chapters, he says, if a prophet comes and he gives you a sign and it does come to pass, but he doesn't call you to worship the Lord alone, according to the words of this covenant, he calls you to worship idols, he calls you to break the covenant, don't listen to him. The Lord your God is testing you. So that's the second test. Same thing if you feel that one, take him out, stone him. So the two tests are a mighty miraculous sign and a call to worship Jesus Christ alone under the authority of God's written word. They pass those two tests. Okay, you got my attention. Uh, the New Testament echoes those tests. It says, test the spirits. It says, this is how you can know if one is true, if they say that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, which was the main heresy that was being taught that day, that he didn't come in the flesh. Uh, we test them in the same ways now, and Today, if someone were to do that, if they were to claim that they were a prophet and we had to listen to them, and they did not pass those two tests, uh, if they were not a member of our church, I would just tell you guys, don't listen to them, and probably call some friends or try to make some kind of public, hey, don't listen to this false prophet. If they were part of our church, we'd call an emergency business meeting, I'd gather you all together, I'd say, this person claims to be a prophet, but they are a false prophet 
I encourage you to move to vote to remove them from membership in our church. This is the New Testament equivalent of what we're taught to do in the Old Testament. So it's serious. This is not just some open, anybody can just claim to be a prophet that you see in a lot of circles. No, it's a serious deal. It's a big deal. I don't expect it will happen in my lifetime. Maybe it will happen as the Lord's return approaches, or maybe it will not. But we got to take 1 Corinthians 13 seriously. That gift will end when we see Jesus Christ face to face. We take that on faith, we trust in that, and we trust his word to guide us, to take us all the way to the very end. All right, those are the questions you guys asked about spiritual gifts. Uh, I want you to know, I love your questions. There were a couple we couldn't get to, I wish we could have. Uh, those of you that had questions that weren't answered, I hope to email you soon. Uh, I just love that we have a church that wants to explore the word of God, that asks difficult questions, brings them to the Lord, and says, Lord, would you answer us? So with those answers from the scriptures, let's go to the prayer, Lord in prayer and let's ask him to bless us. Father, we want to lift up to you first the many in our church who would say, I don't really know how I'm gifted. Would you, would you help them to see it? Would you give them such great and mighty gifting that, that no one can miss it? And that anyone who serves alongside them says, you are gifted in that. Uh, would, you, would you reassure us of any doubt that you're really among us and you're really working within us? And would you give us from that a boldness to serve? Would you give us from that a, a fearlessness to proclaim the gospel to the lost, to proclaim the gospel to lost people we know and lost people we don't know? Would you give us a willingness to hold fast to your word, even when it's difficult, even when we are reviled, and even when we are hated? Uh, would you do that and more from the confidence that we have knowing that your spirit is with us? Father, there are a number of things that we would like to know that we, at least I, can't find clear answers to in the scriptures. And we ask that you would give us a contentment with that, and also at the same time, open our eyes to know more and see the truth. We do long for the day when we won't need that kind of knowledge anymore because we'll have your son right there with us. Oh, would you bring that day soon? Father, we plead, would you send your son to return for us soon? Would you rescue your people? Would you amaze everyone as you do it? We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.